Thank you, and welcome all of you. It's impressive to see so many people who are coming here to be informed about what we have done over the last year in the development tools, unless it's just because you only have two sessions to choose from. But um, at least you're here. Uh, my name is Espen Jus Christoffersen. I have been an architect on the new tool set and the new compiler over the last three, four years. And uh, with me today, I have Alex. Uh, my, my name is Alex Toder, and I've been uh, with the modern development team uh, since the start, almost, uh, and since my start at Microsoft. And it's been an amazing experience, and as you will see in the following uh, hour, it only gets better. So we have divided this presentation today into three main topics. We have a section where we talk about what we have done to improve extensibility. As you heard in the keynote, we are very focused on making a, an extensible app, which allows you to extend it in all the right places and make it even better. And we have a section where we talk about what improvements we have done to the language, to AL, what new things you can do. And least, we have a section around I uh, improvements we have made to the tooling. So what you can do in Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio Code, how we integrate with that and make an even better development experience. But first of all, I'll talk a little bit about extensibility. This is one of the things we have focused very much upon from the beginning with the new compiler and the new uh, development environment. We want you to be able to extend in as many places as possible. And we want that for several reasons. reasons. First of all, when we're in the cloud, as also mentioned in the keynote, we are pushing out new updates every month. And we want that to be a smooth process. Otherwise, we cannot be in the cloud. And in order to do that, we need to have a better separation between your code and our code and the ability to easily update the platform and the application underneath. To do that, we have had many internal discussions. We have, many talks, have had many talks with you about how this would work, how it should work. And we tried to capture the essence of that into a single sentence, which is easily for us to remember whenever we need some guidance in what we are doing. So what we came up with, come up, came up with this to enable partners to efficiently develop maintainable solutions on top of our application while still allowing Microsoft to evolve the application. And there's a couple of highlighted words in there. Efficiently means it should be a top of the class experience for you to develop. It should be fast. You should be easy to do all the tasks you need to do to complete your job and it should be a maintainable solution and what we mean about that is it should be easy to come with new updates add new functionality on top of what we build but at the same time still allowing us to continue to evolve our base application and as boxy showed you we're going to do a lot in that area so we need to have a system language tooling that allows us to do that in a good way one of the feedbacks we have had on what kind of ext extensibility we already implemented and what we still lacked was the case of enums. You have all asked for the ability to extend an enum, what we today call an option string, which is basically just a set of name constants. In CL, we chose to list those options or those constants in the option string. In AL, we chose to call it option members because we thought it was a little bit clearer. But having that information captured in a single property made it very hard for us to come to anything which is extendable. And another um, problem with that construct was also, and whenever you define an option in CL, you have to repeat it all over the place. So if you had red, green, blue, you will have to type that in tons of times. So what we chose to do was basically to create a new top level type, which we called an enum, lack of imagination. We stole the name from C sharp. It's similar concept, but just an AL. 
and with a twist. So it basically lists possible outcomes, values. All the values have an ordinal value. It's actually the exa exactly the same as what you have with an option. This is the one we use for persistence. You can put captions on it. You also have that with options. And by the way, it can be used instead of op options. And long term, we imagine this is going to replace the option type completely. So how do you define a new enum? Basically, simple syntax. We have followed the syntax layout we have reused for all the other objects. Enum, we have an ID, sorry for that, still needed. And, and a name. After that, there's a section of properties. In this case, there's only one, extensible or not. Default is not. And you have the list of values, and all of those values can have a caption. That's the property you can put of those right now. So the use of the enum, that is sort of, you know, now there's something to find it. You want to use it. Use it the same way as many of our other types. You use the, you use the word enum and then the name. In this case, I use it first as a field on a table, and I can also use it as a parameter and a variable, same as option. And whenever you refer to a member on that enum, you do it by the old colon colon and then the member name. So let's switch to a demo. This everyone can see, I hope. I have created a small enum here, it's basically a loyalty enum, and I have let me get my mouse working, I've created a table extension where I add the loyalty enum as a loyalty uh, field on my customer card. And there's a small confession here, I'm a platform developer, I, there's many parts of the app I don't understand any of, so I really prefer the customer cards I can remember the ID and the name. So most of my demos is centered around the customer card. <coughs> I also added the loyalty as the, with a page extension to the uh, customer card so I can view it somewhere. And that's basically enough. So I can now go and deploy it. And here you can see my loyalty and if I change it into edit mode you can also see I get my outcomes here so and this is a backup slide so the extensibility part because I mean this was actually why we needed it in the first place. You need to be able to extend an enum. You need to be able to supply your own outcomes to the enum. And we chose the same kind of syntax that we have for page extensions and table extensions. Now we have an enum extension, so you can create a new enum extension that extends an existing one. And in this case, I basically I extend the loyalty enum I created before. I add another value to it, which is the diamond level. And I supply my, uh, the, the ordinal value. In this case, I take it from my, um, my own range. It's an ID, it will be persisted. So it should be within your own range. So you don't clash with any others. And if I create this and deploy it, I will be able to get a another outcome listed automatically in all the places where I have a drop down on this enum. So this still leaves something behind because actually all the enums that you you want to have made extensible they live in Seaside still. Although we are on the track to remove Seaside, we still have it. We still have our base app in Seaside. 
So we need to find a way to make the enums in Seaside extensible so you could actually be able to extend those. So what we did was that on a table field option, an option placed on the table field, we added a couple of additional attributes. And yeah, it's visible. You have a button here you can mark it as extensible. And you have to give it an ID. Should be in your should be in your range. Actually, it should be in our range because we are the one who will do it. And provide it with a name for the enum. And by doing that, it will end up in the simple files that you get into AL as an enum that you can now extend. So let's try that. And go back to this one. I have first let's take a look inside our old tool here, Seaside. I have marked the application method enum on the customer as extensible. I've given given it an ID and I and a name. And because I have compiled the um, application, in this case running locally on my own machine, with the generate symbol options, I actually generate my own symbols now, which allows me to be able to extend the application method enum. So if we we'll take a look here, I actually... have IntelliSense here because this is the only enum I have available for extensibility right now in these symbols. So, and this is by the way the only thing in this project so I can now deploy it. And go to the custom account. If I remember, here in the application method, as you can see now, I have added my own method from an extension to this. So why don't we just enable all the enums in the base app, mark them as extensible, and then we're good, and you can go party on them. There's a small problem with that, and it's highlighted in this couple of lines of code. Basically, we have m many places in the application where we assume that we know the number of outcomes from the enum. So whenever you and your solutions have gone in, added something to an option string somewhere, you have combed through the application and added your own code in all those places. But you can't do that anymore. So if we mark an enum as extensible, we need to go through all these places in the code and make sure that you have a way of get a saying. Add an event so you will be called saying, this, this happened, do something, because we don't know what this case line should be. So, so the way we are going to do that is that we are going to accept requests on enum extensibility and we will add them uh, and prioritize that those. And over time, we will have all the right enums marked as extensible. There's a small, small other twist to the enum compared to the option. First of all, they are not a assignable to anything like the option. Basically, the option type today, you can assign it to integers, to the bytes, to the decimal, doesn't matter. Any numeric value will go. We have tightened that a bit. Actually, you can only assign an enum to an enum of the same type. And there's no implicit conversion to and from integer. Right now, we support implicit conversion to an option type. 
Um, we need that in the cases where the base app is actually exposing something as an option where you may have marked the table field or we have marked the table field as an enum. Then that shows up as an enum. We need to be able to call the old method, which takes an option. So right now that's supported and that's your actually the only conversion method right now is to assign it into an option and utilize that. We will be adding real conversion methods for enums in the future. In the future update, we haven't done it yet, but we will. Another thing which is also missing is the ability to um, to, uh, to extend a split relation. The sample code before um, was on the sales line type, which is actually a split relation, defined as a split relation. We cannot do, y do that yet, but we will add that functionality so you can point it to another table if, you, if we extend that enum. Enough about enums. We have added some more extensibility for you. One of those we have added, also often requested, is field group extensibility. So in the first iteration, we didn't support any kind of changes to field group. But what we heard a lot was that, oh, I need to have this and this in the drop-down field group so it shows up. All my customers want that. So what we have added is the ability to add last to a field group. This will not solve all scenarios, but it will solve the most common one, and we will add more over time. So you can add to the drop-down um, field group, for instance, a new field you added, or just one of those that we didn't think anyone would use. Um, and let's jump to the demo. That. By the way, this is a good reminder here. Um, I'm prompted here to update to the latest Visual Studio Code, 1.29. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> and this is the <laughs> problem with living in the cloud, we have a small issue with that version, which we are looking at, um, which means that right now <laughs> you should be using 1.28 with the AL extension, because when you deploy, we fail to lock the deployment steps in the lock. It actually contacts the server, it deploys, but you cannot see it. Um, they have made a protocol change and we need to adapt to it. And um, we unfortunately have, got, have gotten a couple of those surprises over the last couple of years. But for now, I will dismiss this. I have a um, small field group uh, extension here. I will extend the customer table on all the customers. I will actually add the sales uh, for that customer. And for the items, I will add description two. It's also a very often requested uh, field to add to the dropdown. Now you can do it as yourself if we forget to. So let's just deploy that one as well. And let's look at the sales order, which is probably the one with the most drop downs in the app. So we can look at the customer here, all the way to the right. We have the sales local currency and if we go to the item here <laughs> it must be chrome <laughs> <laughs> try again one last time You will have to believe me, it's out there to the right. <coughs> and pass the backup slides. Another thing we have added, 
And I mean, the problem was that you could add a bunch of new objects, but the help was actually in the cloud, just pointing to our help server. So we have added the ability to add help links on objects. And those help links are the ones that will be invoked whenever you ask for help. And you can point it to your own external help server if you want to. What we have also added is the is a local um, uh, replaceable part of that URL. In this case, it's the curly bracket um, zero curly bracket end, and that will be replaced with with the uh, with the local information. And that local information you can limit in the app.json. You can specify which locales you actually support, and if you are running, the users are running with one which is not supported, it will pick the one, the first one from that list and put that into the help URL. Um, you will have to do that for all your objects. We are looking at if we can implement a feature where you basically specify a base URL and then we will automatically request, move all requests to that, but we haven't done that yet. Another thing we added, as mentioned in the keynote, we have added a lot of integration events, almost 3,000 over the last couple of years. And it's very complex to find out what to extend. And um, since my manager stole my, uh, most of my demo here, I, I knew about it. I'm not going to demo it. Basically, we have added the event recorder which is a nice way of being able to see what events are fired when you execute a action. Post sales order, you will get, I don't know, several hundreds, I think. Um, but then it will give you an idea of where you actually want to stick in the knife and add your own code. So, and what he didn't show was actually we have proved the improved the the intelligence for events. So compared to C side, whenever you did an event subscription, you just got a a, um, a procedure with all the parameters which are actually available for that event, which is not necessarily very efficient, and it also meant that you will now take a dependency on all that. If all those parameters, even though you only used one or two of them. So we went in another direction with a, uh, and one of the reasons, of course, is that it's a completely different way of doing development with a source file rather than the more prescriptive uh, seaside way of doing it. So we rely heavily on IntelliSense in all, in all places. And what we have added now is actually that when you have a subscription, which in this case I could have dog out using the event recorder, pasted that in, I create my method, and now I need to figure out what parameters I can actually use for this event. So we have added an IntelliSense here that says that, oh, there's a report ID, fine, I need that. One more. Okay. And I will also pick the run mode. So it's an easy way to get that information surfaced as intelligence. And I think that's actually your cue, Alex. So in the last year, uh, their language, its base library and its runtime have been extended and improved with two big goals in mind. One, to make you more productive than uh, you've ever been before in Seaside, and two, to support the seamless conversion of your existing CL solutions. In the next few minutes, I will talk about the improvements we've made to reporting, uh, how .NET interoperability works in AL, about OData bound actions, and isolated storage. So reporting, is the one of the areas that has received the most improvements in the last year. When reports were first introduced uh, in AL, it was fairly difficult to create a new report with a new layout. 
if you, for example, you wanted to create a new word layout, you had to create your report, publish it, go to the client, uh, create a word, word layout from there, download it, add it to your project, make some modifications, then republish it, and then go through these steps every time you wanted to do modifications to the data set. You know, starting with the spring release of Business Central, we have improved this process a lot. So far that it only takes a few seconds to create a new layout for a report, as I will show now by creating a, by creating a better customer list. So I already have my report. Uh, can you see it? Nope, sorry. Now, so I have my better customer list here. And uh, it has a customer table as a data source because as Isban said, uh, we really like the customer table. Uh, the number and three columns, uh, the number, the name, and the address. And now I'll uh, add a word layout and I'll specify the path to a local Word document that will contain the layout. So better customer list docx because it needs to be a Word document. Right, and I will set the default layout to be Word because I, I don't want to deal with our DLC during a live presentation. <laughs> uh, now we're set, and as you can see, there's no better customer list, oops. There's no better customer list document here. But if I press Control Shift B and build, the document is created. And if I click open externally, it will open in Word. And let it's uh, an empty layout, but if I go to the XML mapping pane, I can see that our data set is here. So if I click on this, I see the custom with the, all the three columns. And every time you make a change to the data set in the report, the changes will be reflect reflected in the data set in the layout. And this works for both Word and RDLC. So let's go ahead and just create uh, our uh, much better customer list. And let's just make uh, use a table for the customer list and had add the three table headers name and address and three simple plain text controls for each of the columns. And also we need to make sure that we have one row for each customer. So we're going to select this uh, row and uh, make it a repeater. Good. And we save. And that's the layout. And now if I publish, and search for best um, better customer list, shows up here and let's just preview it quickly and we can see the newly created uh, word layout that took only a few seconds to build. Of course we know that a lot of you have spent more than a few seconds on uh, creating uh, layouts for your customers and creating reports and that you would like uh, your customers to use these instead of the ones that uh, come uh, sh uh, with Business Central. So starting with Business Central of Fall we have added the uh, ability to globally substitute uh, reports. So this means that instead of having to go to every place where a report is uh, run and make the replacement, you can do it in one place globally by using uh, an event subscriber. So I already have my code unit that will do the substitution. So all you need to do is to subscribe to the report management code unit to the on after substitute report. It's a funny name, but that's the, <laughs> the paradigm. Um, and this uh, event publisher has offers you two parameters. Report ID, which is the ID of the report that is being run, and a uh, new report ID, which can be used to set the report that should run instead. So what I'm doing here is just checking if the report ID is the ID of the customer list, and if that is true, just uh, substituting it with a better customer list. Before I deploy this, let's just go back to our client and search for the customer list. 
and if you give it a few seconds, we see the uh, customer list that ships with Business Central, which I find uh, inferior to mine because I created it, and of course it's better. Um, so let's uh, publish our extension. And now if we search for the, uh, the customer list and we run it, we see that uh, starting from the request page, we already have the better customer list. Right? So the substitution happens before anything else has to, uh, that has to do with the report happens. Uh, and if we press preview, we of course get uh, our customer list. Uh, let's go back to the slides. So one small detail that you have to take into consideration is that substitution only happens when a report is run through uh, as a result of a user activating an action that has the run object set as a report or uh, when it is run uh, through one of the static methods on the report class. Reports cannot be substituted when uh, executed from a variable. So if you have foo report customer list and foo.run, that will always run the customer list, not the better customer list in this case. So let's skip through these. To improve reporting even more, we've added uh, more information to, uh, we've exposed more information about reports and request pages. We have added uh, two new vir virtual tables, all control fields and report date items. The all control fields uh, table contains information about all the page controls on normal pages and request pages on reports and uh, XML ports. And the report data items uh, table contains information about the individual data items on a report. So using uh, these new tables, you can extract information about a specific report and send it off to a third party system which uh, can, can present an alternative UI to the user or get input through, through some other mechanism and send back um, the request page parameters XML. Essentially what this allows you to do is to uh, separate the execution of the request page from the execution of the report uh, and gives you more flexibility in how you interact with external systems. Uh, we have all, in the slides, we also have the schema of these new tables for reference, but uh, you can look at these after the presentation. And we also have code to do, uh, that uh, can help you get started with uh, this new scenario. You can find it in the slides and also in uh, online in our, uh, in our documentation. And finally, after two years of people asking when this is coming back, we have uh, .NET interoperability, but only for on-premise. Um, so again, only for on-premise, because this is the most important thing. In the cloud, we, we suggest to use uh, alternatives such as Azure Functions and all the other uh, goodies offered by uh, the Azure cloud or even uh, other parties. Um, I think the easiest way to show how .NET works is to start with, uh, to, go, to go through a demo. And if you remember how .NET worked in the C side is that every time you had to add a variable, uh, you had to go through a series of dialogues uh, until you selected um, the, the type. So you first had to select the assembly and then you had to s uh, go through a long list to select the type and you had to do this for every time you, ha you wanted to add a new variable to your code. Um, but with, uh, with in AL, we wanted to streamline this experience. But before I, st I start with the demo, we have to make sure we're targeting on-prem. So I need to specify that I am the target is internal in my app JSON, and because the compiler runs uh, separately from the server, so we, you have a version of the compiler in VS Code with the language extension. You also need to tell this compiler where to, where to look for assembly uh, for assemblies for .NET assemblies, and you can do this by going to your settings panel and 
setting the a a assembly probing paths to paths where you have assembly. So in this case, I set it to C Windows assembly, which is the location of the global assembly cache. Uh, and uh, another folder that contains uh, assemblies from the uh, from the server on my machine. Uh, and now, if we go back to here, we have a simple .NET uh, container. So you should only you only need to declare uh, the types that you are using once. And you do this in a .NET container where you specify a list of assemblies that you will be using by using the assembly name. And of course, you can specify other characteristics of the assembly, uh, assembly as properties, culture, culture, version, and so on. Uh, and then you go on to specify the types. And you do this by uh, specifying the fully qualified type name, followed by an optional alias. This alias is used uh, in code so that you don't have to say system.datetime every time. You can say my datetime. If you do not specify an alias, the compiler will generate one for, for you. Uh, for example, uh, just using the class name in 32. So that's how you declare the, the fact that you want to use .NET. And when it comes to usage, um, let's go back to our favorite uh, page and extend it. So I want to add two new fields to the page, uh, my daytime text, where the user can enter uh, a text in uh, his locale, and uh, my daytime that will show the, uh, the result of parsing this, this text. And I'm going to use the .NET um, daytime uh, type to do the parsing. So if I have the to declare that I'm using a .NET variable, I need to use the .NET keyword followed by uh, the type. And you, as you see, you get uh, IntelliSense, and I just need to use my date time. And that's, and you see, even though I I'm using the uh, same name, which is a bad, bad practice, uh, I do not get conflicts. Right, so I can say my date time is BP parse, and uh, my date time text. One improvement we've made to .NET uh, in AL versus CL is that now you can uh, chain methods and also get auto completion for this. So now I can, because parse returns a uh, date, I can call uh, methods on date, and for example, let's, uh, we, I can add a few days to the date. And you see I get a full signature in .NET and I have full information about the type. So I can add five days to this just to, and now if I build, and publish, yes, <laughs> ah, yes, um, let's remove this. That's probably because I messed be with the demo before. <laughs> Good, so I have uh, my two fields on the customer card, and if I enter some gobbledygook, uh, I will get an error from uh, the system date I've parsed, and if I enter a date in my locale, December 13, you see because I added five hours, uh, it parses it, uh, I added five days, it uh, parses it as, uh, it parses it as, as December 13 and adds five days, so the date is 18 of December. But uh, working with uh, .NET types is not enough because uh, in CAL, you also could use uh, events from .NET. And uh, to, in order to use events, you had to, one second. So to use events in, uh, in uh, Seaside, you had to go to uh, select a global variable, open its properties window, and uh, set the with events attribute to true. And Seaside would generate stops for all the events that you had on that, uh, that type. In uh, AL, we don't want to generate unnecessary boilerplate. Um, so we rely on in IntelliSense for helping with events. First, I need to specify the with events attribute on the, on the variable to tell the compiler that I'm going to use events from this. And then when I want to subscribe, I'm going to use triggers because, so I start by using the trigger keyword followed by the name of the variable and then I get auto completion for the events that are available on, uh, on this type. And if I just say elapsed, 
I get the full uh, signature of the event. And you see that the compiler is complaining a bit because it's, uh, it says that it doesn't know about this type. So if I go back to Donet, I see that I've defined an alias for this. So I'm just going to use the alias because I like it more than the predefined uh, type. That's an area for improvement. Um, and let's just print a message when uh, this event uh, is triggered. So let's print the signal time. And also make sure to stop our timer because it might get annoying. So now if I publish this, at some point, I'm impatient, so I get prompted uh, about the uh, about the event. Uh, in the previous case, uh, the page uh, loaded slower than uh, the timeout I set, so the timer was stopped before I could uh, see the the message. Um, and one other piece of .NET interoperability that is widely used in CL is for interacting with uh, JavaScript and .NET add-ins. Uh, moving forward, we recommend that you migrate these add-ins to native AL add-ins, but we realize that uh, you might not want to do this right now. Uh, so for the time being, uh, you can uh, continue using your existing .NET uh, add-ins. So if you convert the CL code to AL, you'll probably get uh, something similar to this and the compiler complaining that it ca cannot find the uh, control add in Microsoft Dynamics Nav Client Ping Pong. So we can, we can solve this by going to our .NET container and declaring a type that corresponds to the .NET add-in and specifying that it is a control add-in. So here I have the full, uh, fully qualified name of the type in uh, .NET followed by the alias that is uh, used uh, in the code. And that's it. That's everything you need to do to uh, convert your uh, existing CL uh, usages, .NET usages in CL to AL. Most of this is uh, done automatically by the, by the compiler. The only step that you need to do if you have custom add-ins is to specify the, the add-ins that you use when uh, running the TXT to AL conversion. Um, so let's move on. Backup slides. And the next major improvement we've made is isolated storage. We've received a lot of questions from, uh, from you around how to store values in such a way that other extensions cannot access them. Most of the questions came from uh, developers uh, that wanted to store uh, values necessary for interacting with external systems or uh, building their own uh, licensing uh, systems. Um, the answer to all these questions is isolated storage. In essence, it allows you to store key value pairs in such a way that only the application that stored them can also retrieve them. Um, the values are stored in a new uh, non-company table called isolated storage, and it, uh, it's left up to you to decide if you want to store them encrypted or in plain text. Uh, furthermore, you can uh, res uh, specify the scope of the data. By default, all the data is stored at the module level. So the data is accessible to the application independent of the user or the company in which it is used. If you, you can use the data scope system option to restrict this, and for example, if you specify data scope user, you can restrict this to the user level. So only the user that stored the data can also retrieve it. The fourth area of improvement is OData bound actions in AL. Uh, OData, for those of you that might not be familiar, is a protocol that is a standard that uh, defines best practices for uh, creating and consuming uh, RESTful uh, services. Uh, this uh, standard is well supported by Business Central uh, and uh, it allows you to interact with entities defined in the application over HTTP. A bound action is nothing more than a procedure that is exposed 
uh, through the OData protocol. Until now, it was not possible to create bound actions uh, in, uh, in AL, uh, mostly because the mechanism for which the runtime interacted with the OData protocol relied on a few .NET types, and .NET is still not, is not allowed uh, in the cloud. Um, to solve this, we have added the web service action context and web service action result code data types that allow you to uh, migrate or write uh, procedures that can be exposed as bound actions uh, in uh, AL and in the cloud. Uh, the only prerequisite to exposing uh, a, a procedure as a bound action is to have the service enabled attribute. Uh, one small limitation that we currently have is that you cannot add uh, bound actions via page extensions. So if you want to create uh, new bound actions, you need to create a new page or query. And all, all the innovation in the last uh, two years has uh, been greatly helped by uh, Visual Studio Code. It, it is a great platform to develop for and it has allowed us to add better tooling at a faster pace. Um, I encourage you to uh, explore the marketplace and uh, if you find uh, an extension that uh, uh, is useful, use it freely or if not, uh, feel free to develop your own extensions that complement the language extension and make them available to, to the community. With, uh, we've had a lot of uh, feedback from you regarding their language extension and our team has worked diligently to fix as many as, or address as many of the issues that you've reported on GitHub. By default, these issues uh, get fixed in the master branch of our repository, which targets the next major uh, version of uh, Business Central. What this meant is that um, backporting some of the IntelliSense improvements uh, or minor bug fixes was uh, a labor-intensive task. And because each version of Business Central shipped with its own version of the extension, the, the effort grew as t uh, time uh, went by. Starting with Business Central Fall, we are shipping only one version of the language extension that can be used with all versions of Business Central. So you do not have to wait for the next major release to benefit from the fixes uh, that we do. Uh, of course, different versions of uh, Business Central um, have different, uh, slightly different capabilities. And uh, we want the compiler the, uh, to let you know if you're using a feature that is not available in your uh, current version of Business Central. To help with this, we've added the runtime property in the app, uh, app JSON. And this can be used to specify the version of, the, of Business Central that you are targeting. We associate, associate version 1.0 with the spring release, 2.0 with the full release, and we increment by one for each major release of the product. Uh, all this work has been done uh, for the benefit of you as a consumer of their language extension. Internally, this meant that we had to version all the bits that make up the language, uh, the syntax, the properties, the library, and so on. Um, but we believe it was worth the effort because now you can uh, use, you can benefit from, from all the fixes we do shortly after they go into the master branch. So, as you can see, .NET uh, was one of the things we, we versioned first. And to see how this works, let's go back to our .NET demo and open our app JSON. So right now, the, I'm targeting runtime 2.0, which corresponds to the full release of Business Central. If I, if I downgrade to 1.0, I will immediately get warnings saying that .NET interop is not available in this runtime and you'll get this for all the features, thereby enabling you to get feedback faster. And uh, I think that's it from my side. Desmond? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, it's already up there. 
Well, I probably need to. Wake my computer up. Yeah. Um, some of the improvements we have made um, is to the debugger. Uh, they were still lagging behind the old uh, wind client debugger uh, you have known for some years. And, and we have added some more functionality to close that gap. And some of the options we have, or what we have added in this release is the ability to now break an error, which means that whenever an error occur, you will be placed on the offending line. Um, and we have also added the break, break on record write, which is basically insert, modify, delete on any record uh, in the system. The way you specify that is in the launch.json file, which is the one that tells you or tells how to launch the debugger or the um, when, when, uh, when you do a deployment from Visual Studio Code. And another thing we have added is also the ability to set breakpoints in external code, which is a, a change from before. And what is actually enabling that is the ability to browse into old code CL code. And in this case, if I place my mouse or cursor on top of the customer record here, I can actually do F12. And now I navigate into the source files for that object. It's a little bit, the source files in this case are a little bit different. As you can see up there, they have the extension DL, which is short for debugging AL. But we have inserted all the code from the um, from the original object in this case it's the same it's the same format as you are used to see in the in the old debugger but actually down at the end here we have the the rest of the object information so you can see this is the fuel groups this is actually the keys and all the fields on the customer table all the properties are not there there and this is but this is an interim solution until we are all on AL because then you will be able to go to exactly the original source file. So let's go back here. And this is the browse CL code, base app code from Visual Studio Code I just showed. Another thing, another benefit from using Visual Studio Code is actually they are very great at adding new functionality, new innovations. And one of the things that they have added is the outline view. This is a, this is a tree view that is added or available inside Visual Studio Code. And you can use that to surface elements in a file. And in this case, those elements are actually our symbolic information. We had some of it already available for it, but we have now tweaked it a little bit to fit the outline view even better. So let's try to take a look at that and find this small project here, which is called W1. Um, so you can see here, this is actually a, a, um, a converted W1 application I have loaded into Visual Studio Code. And if I pick the sales order page, which is huge, oops, I can try to pull up here the Maybe I cannot make it any bigger. Um, down here, there's the outline view. And in here, you can actually see the structure of the file. There's a layout session, area content. There's even something which is green, which is, which disappeared. <laughs> it was actually the group itself. Um, 
And the green color is because there is a, um, a warning on it, so you can actually, from the outlook, or from the outline view here, spot areas in the file which there's something that you sh that should should uh, point your attention to. It will be red if it's an error. In this case, it's just a warning. But I can actually use this as a quick way to find, navigate to places in the file. I can even do search if I want to search for something with customer in it. It will filter down and show me all the areas which contains customer. And I can navigate to that. Um, so very, very efficient way of navigating around if you can control your mouse better than I can. Another improvement we, we have made uh, this release is that we have improved some of the IntelliSense. We have added direct help lin links from the IntelliSense, so if you click the get help, it will actually um, open the uh, our, our online documentation where you can read about those properties. That online documentation today is actually hosted on, uh, so you can so you can add suggestions if you find that this topic is is not containing containing enough information, or can you maybe explain this better? And our uh, UA writers will actually see this, pick it up, and maybe ask some developers to help improve on it, or maybe do write some more themselves. Another thing we improved is actually, I mean, it's a bit hard to choose an icon from a named list. So we actually utilize the ability to, to, to add images to the help uh, in IntelliSense. So actually when you look at the image property on an action, for instance, when you scroll down, you can actually see the icon which is associated with the name. So you have a better chance of choosing the right one. Launching the browser, we have heard that complaint a lot of times. I mean, why do we open the new instance of the browser every time you deploy? Now you can change that behavior. There's a new launch bro browser property in the launch.json that you can set to false. If you do that, we will just deploy without opening the browser. By default, it's true, but you are free to change it um, as you like. <coughs> ID ranges. We all love to hate IDs, but um, we are not able to remove them right now or anytime soon. We have, <laughs> it's unfortunately the truth, we, <laughs> we have a licensing system that still sits on top of them, and our entire runtime platform is actually um, very much utilizing the fact that we have an integer that represents all our objects. From a development perspective, as a, as a developer, I would really love to get rid of them, but um, it will take some time. So, but in order to help you not entering IDs which are without outside your own range, we added the ID range property to the app.json file um, in, in the first release. But a lot of you have actually told us that it's not really good enough because your ID range are often fragmented. So you got some IDs, someone else got the next ones, and you got some IDs in another place. So we have added a new ID ranges property that you can use instead. This is available in the for from the full release of the compiler. And that allows you to specify multiple ranges that you can work in. Um, so, another thing we optimized in the tooling is how to generate permission sets. In order to submit an app to App Source, you need to provide a permission set with permissions for all the tables that you add. We haven't been that good at actually telling you exactly what you needed to do and, and how it should be formatted. We added a number of snippets that we thought would help you. Maybe it did, but it was definitely not enough. So we have added a new command, which is 
called generate permission set. And what it actually does is that it takes your uh, extension and looks for all the tables and generates a default permission set for you. So let's try to do that. And I'm, uh, I'm not going to do it on top of W1. Let me I actually think I need to create a table. So let's do that quickly. That feels in here. And I'll have a table. And if I try to submit this to AppSource, apart from the fact that it's completely useless, it will not be accepted because I didn't include a permission set for it. So what I can do is that I can use Control Shift V to get to the command palette and say I want to do generate permission set. And that one actually creates a file for me with, oh, with a permission set in it containing my objects and Unfortunately, I'm here I'm running on a not shift version with a bug in, so I generate a too many <laughs> permission sets. Um, but it will generate a, a permission for each of the tables included in your extension, so you can go, you have a template for setting the permissions that you want for those tables. It's amazing. We saw that this bug at directions, I have fixed it. And I even, though I did that, I managed to get a version down here with <laughs> that one fixed in. So, but it should have just generated a permission for the only table I had in the extension. One of the new things we have added as well is analyzers. They have actually been in there for a while, but we have really not said a lot about it and we have wanted to spend some more time improving the actual analyzers. The analyzer is a separate assembly that um, is called by the compiler, and it's possible to add rules in there so it can validate syntax, semantic validations, whatever rules in there. Um, the results are shown together with the compiler output. If you run it from the command line, it will be some of the compiler output on the command line. If you run it within Visual Studio Code, it will show up in the same window as the rest of the errors from the compiler. And you can use rules from rule sets to control the severity of, of, um, of errors or, or warnings. You can make warnings into errors if you said this is actually something which is so bad that it should be treated as an error in our case. So, as Boxy showed at the keynote, um, these are the list of what we have today. I want to talk more about that. I'll talk about how to enable them. There's two properties that control this in the settings file. There's enable code analysis, ta-da, now they're enabled. And there's the code anal analyzers, which is a list of analyzers which should be enabled. In this case, I've enabled the code cop and the app source cop analyzer. The rule sets, uh, we have <coughs> it's basically a file that specifies um, how, how individual errors or warnings should be treated. Um, it's writing, it's, it's, it lives together with the project and, and we have added a couple of snippets to help you add new rules to those. In this case, it's elevating a warning into an error or actually everything into an error. Um, and another config file is also worth mentioning is actually um, the app source cop, cop JSON file. The app source cop is the one you need to run and have a clean run on before you submit to app source. And one of the things that one actually validates is that you haven't deleted any fields, any tables, or anything which will, which will cause a schema update. 
And the only thing that can, it can validate that is actually to point to the previous version of your shift uh, app. And the way you specify that is that in the, in, in the appsourcecut.json file, you have the version number, name and, pub name and publisher for the previous one, which you type in there. And then when the analyzer is, analyzer is running, it will actually validate that for each table you have, that you haven't deleted any fields, you haven't modified any, changed any types that will require a schema change. Um, and, and help you not breaking any of those rules. And you can also add uh, prefix or suffix um, for and, and have the analyzer checking that you are actually using your, um, your uh, prefix or suffix that you are using for your um, solution. And then the macOS version. I have actually demoed it down here in last year, but we haven't been able to ship it until recently. So in the uh, marketplace, uh, v6 file is actually both uh, a Windows version and also a Mac OS version. There is some limitation in functionality, but it's actually <laughs> only almost only around uh, uh, reports and report editing specifically because there is no RDLC editor or RDL layout editing on macOS. We have no tooling <laughs> for that. And the uh, XML pane that Alex showed before is not available in the, in the um, word for Mac. Sort of a bit out of our hands, but that's unfortunately the truth. But you can still compile and, and change data sets so you can work with project that contains reports. You can just not edit the layout. And also .NET is also uh, not supported. So, and last I think, translations. We added XLIF as our translation format. Uh, we have heard a lot of request for separating the translations from the source files so they are actually different artifacts. And internally for us it made a lot of sense and we think this is a good plan. We stick with a, um, a standardized format which is XLIF. Everyone is happy. Uh, it turned out not so much because as some of you pointed out in the cases of pertinent extensions and in other situations it's a bit cumbersome to actually have the XLIF and if you don't have a separate translation team or maybe a, even a translation agency and just do it yourself, it's actually far easier to still have them in the source files. So we sort of reverted our previous uh, planned decision about obsoleting uh, caption ML are actually sticking with it, but you can only choose one. You cannot use both at the same time. So we will allow you to use um, caption emails still, just not for app source submissions. If you are submitting an, an app for app source, you will have to use XLIF based translations. And if you are actually using XLIF based translations, we have made that a bit easier because we, in the generated XLIF format, we have this transunit ID and it's hard to read because it's actually hashed of table names and, and field names and property names. And the reason for that is that there is a boundary to the length of that ID that we had to obey to. So we could not just concatenate all the names, unfortunately. But what we did instead is actually to add the real names into, the, uh, into an annotation inside the um, trans unit. So you can see that this was actually the shipping rates table and it was the name field, and in this case, the caption. This should make it, make it easier to identify which AL element it came from. This was the last slide, so let's open up for questions. Um,
one here, then I don't have to throw it that far. So, uh, the, about the debugging. Yes. Uh, is it possible, I know it's not possible right now, uh, is it technologically possible, and are you planning to let us debug uh, JavaScript, especially in control headings? Um, right now, we do not support it. Uh, don't know what, if, if, how we can make it work, actually. Uh, we know the scenario, and, and it's definitely uh, something we would like to do. I think you can do something if you run to, you should do your code side by side, but I'm actually not sure about it. Other questions? I have actually two questions. Uh, one about keys. Yeah. Uh, as I know, we are not allowed to add keys uh, in our table extension for the fields which are used in actual table. Uh, will we be allowed to do it somehow? Um, uh, it's, it's one of the most <laughs> requested features. Uh, we would like to support it, but there's also some complications with it that we need to solve first because, because of the way we are doing it. I mean, the table extension ends up in a companion table, which means that in order to add fields from the base table, we actually need to replicate those tables into the, into the companion table in order to do it. Um, we are thinking about it. I don't have any timeline for it. It's definitely something we hear a lot. And another one about query object. It's now really limited. <laughs> Uh, are there planning to do it a bit better? <laughs> we don't have any immediate plans, but I mean, please let us know what you are lacking or how we, what you think is missing. Um, okay. More questions? One there. Regarding the uh, enumerate extension thing, uh, yeah. if your app extends, for example, table 39's uh, line type, uh, how would you recommend you solve it if you have to remove that or the customer is not going to use it anymore and you have uh, records dependent on it? It will, yeah, I mean, if you just remove it, which you can, but now you will have left, I mean, outcomes with, with unknown IDs, basically. And, and it, 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 nothing breaks, actually. It will leave them with, with the ID that you gave them, and that will actually show off the UI. Um, I think, the, I mean, you probably need to do some kind of data cleanup. And in some cases, I, I think it's different, difficult to to say exactly what you need to do because it depends on what it was that that outcome meant. If it's crucial for some of your accounting that you actually had this special flavor of something, maybe it's actually not really an option to remove it um, because maybe that information should stay in there. Uh, otherwise, you will have to write code that basically enumerates all your objects and change it into whatever then makes sense because for some reason you chose that outcome at some point <coughs> and what does it mean to remove it? Yeah, it was just an extreme example, but yeah. yeah. Just but I mean, you can do it, uh, yank out the extension at, and it will keep running, but now you'll just see uh, the ordinal value. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> More questions on the front rows? Oh, there's one up there. Yeah, so I actually have two questions. So yeah. the first one is um, if the AL language extension is planned to be backwards compatible with NV 2018, and if not, are we going to be able to have two separate extensions? Um, 
Are you talking about the extensions you develop in AL or, or about no, the, uh, the AL language extension for Visual okay, Studio Code? Okay, so yeah. that's one thing that I forgot to mention. Uh, you can use the AL language extension from the marketplace with any version of Business Central. So for NAV 2018, you should use the extension that ships uh, with the product. And if, you, if there are any bugs in that one, you need to uh, make requests for yeah. fixes. And, but uh, it should be compatible in the sense that anything that worked in uh, 2018 should work in uh, the latest version. Yeah, and uh, uh, continuing in this, uh, will we be able to have those two extensions installed at the same time? Uh, no, you will have to, uh, they can be installed, but you have to disable one or the other, otherwise they will compete on giving you compiler feedback. And there's one more important thing that you should remember. Whenever you update the AL language extension, it only updates uh, the compiler that is used by Visual Studio Code and the extension, right? Yeah. So the compiler that is running on your server and that compiles your extension when you, when you publish is still the one that was shipped with the server, right? Okay, so the next question is about inflation files. Uh, for now, the only if I update something in translate translation file, the base file gets updated, and uh, the other uh, children files uh, don't. So is there any plans to make it so they do update? Yeah, we, we know we can do better in that area, yes. I cannot give you a timeline for it, but yes, it's not optimal, no. Okay. Thank you. There was one up there. Sit on the front row the next time. <laughs> uh, my question is: um, You said that um, if we have uh, .NET add-in developed for C site, um, if we want to use uh, this uh, in Business Central on cloud, we need to migrate it to AL .NET control add-in. How it, what does this mean? To no. move it to no. Azure functions or? I, I will clarify that a bit. So uh, you can use your existing .NET add-ins on-prem. Everything related to .NET is on-prem. That includes JavaScript add-ins. Uh, if you want to use an add-in uh, in the cloud, you can use the ones that ship with Business Central. So we already have the Business Chart add-in uh, included. Uh, but if you want to add your own add-ins, they need to be native AL control add-ins. So this is a specific type that allows you to uh, package JavaScript and uh, CSS as an add-in and deploy it with your extension. Hi. Uh, regarding dependencies, so currently when you're doing uh, personalization on the pages, it adds it dependencies to every single extension that's been installed. Uh, that is, I understand, getting changed pretty soon. Yes. So do we have a timeline for that? And uh, it will soon, we have, we're working on it. It will be in spring. I don't know if we will move it to the updates. I'm not sure about that. Thank you. Is that? Up here. Um, with the field groups, you yes. use the command at last to yes. set it at the end. Can you set a field anywhere in the already existing field group? No, um, not not right now. We know that this is not solving all issues. Uh, and and we may add more functionality in the future, but right now we, I mean, you can you can move it around, personalize it around, but you cannot, as a part of the extension, tell it to be the first. Thank you. Um, you showed us um, use up here, but yeah. <laughs> 
Um, you showed us using the F12 to look up to a uh, you know, declared a variable. We, we could then look up to the code behind it. Yeah, yes. Um, the DAL files. Uh, you can't go any deeper than that, can you? Once you've seen something in that DAL file, and you want to think, oh, I need to look at that function, move on. Um, no, no, okay. unfortunately not. Um, and the reason for that is that, I mean, we do not have all that symbolic information for the, uh, for the stuff that comes out of uh, CL. Okay, and the other thing was, in the old C site, it was useful to be able to browse through existing objects and look for things in there, go, I need to do something, how does NAV do it? Are we going to be able to look at, uh, do that sort of browsing? Browsing of, of, the, uh, of the source code in, yeah. in general? Um, I mean, we're not, we're not closing uh, the source code. It will still be open, you'll still be able to see it today, the browser is C site. Um, in the future, it will still be available, um, and we know that the entire discoverability of existing AL code is an important part of development for you. Um, so, so you'll add it into the S code at some point? I mean, at some point it will be, I mean, one full extension sitting on a GitHub repo that you can grab and, and, and work with. Any other questions? Watch out. Yeah, it was uh, basically uh, a similar to the keys and the issue with the companion tables. What about if you want to add a, an extra key but not, not using the companion table? So uh, like the fields are already in, say like table 17 say, are you, um, thinking, uh, are you thinking of that at all? I don't think we have any immediate plans for that. Um, and, but I'm actually not sure. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I'm just, ju just thinking of performance as much as anything. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. All right, okay. Maybe. I, I know why it's a problem, but... <laughs> Um, I also have two questions. Uh, my yeah. first one is, you've shown us the way to add a field to a field group, but is there a way to add a new field group to an existing page or, ta or, or table? Yeah, you can add new field groups. The problem is that if, I mean, some of those, some, some of the field groups, the drop down and the break has special meanings and you cannot add a new one because if they're already there. I've seen how I've seen several uh, tables without field without the drop-down field group. Yes. So can we add those? Yes. yes. Okay. And uh, the second question is, um, you've shown us the debugger or the new debugger features, um, but is there a way to attach a debugger to an existing uh, tenant? Because now we have to publish an app to debug, but we also yeah. have to debug without publishing an app. Yeah. Un unfortunately, not yet. Um, we want to add that feature, but it didn't make it for fall. We, I mean, it's, of course, it should be like that, but we just haven't, haven't had time yet. Maybe. <laughs> so, there's one question up here. Hi, this is regarding translations. You said that the ML properties will still be available for yes. customizations. Is this just for a longer time or forever? <laughs> forever is a, is a lot, but, but I mean, <laughs> we are basically, we, I mean, we are not removing the support for them because we acknowledge that it's a, this is an easy, easy way to provide translations for pertinent extensions or smaller extensions. The only limitation is that if you want to submit to AppSource, we will require you to use Xlib.
uh, you show us this uh, extension to replace the report with another report. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, then we don't have to change the report selection. Yes. yes. But how about the printer selection? Will it work? Or do we need to put the new report in the printer selection? Or will it print to the standard printer? I think it should work in, in general because uh, as long as the report is invoked through one of the entry points that I, I've uh, showed, shown in the slides, uh, the, the substitution will happen, uh, happen before anything. So if it's printed, it, the report you select will be used. Thank you. Anybody else? It's about the same as your report um, replacement. Um, this is global, uh, for example, for your customer list, but if you wanna make it dependent on the data, is this possible or in the future? Uh, by the data, what kind of data? Because yeah, for, for example, you have a sa sales invoice and you make it, want to make it dependent on, s on certain customers. Each customer has a, another uh, sales invoice report. Not at the moment. Okay. But if you have a specific scenario, feel free to open an issue on GitHub and we can discuss it there. Okay. And um, in regards to multiple events on the same uh, act or activity, is there any news or update or cha uh, upcoming changes in the order in which they're fired? If you can manipulate that, for instance, if you, well, if two, um, two modules have an on after modify event on a specific field. So far it's forced which is where, which happens first and second. Is there anything new in regards to that? Um, we have no immediate plans, but uh, I mean, we are considering whether that could be something which could be changed in a paternal extension because it's then someone will have the final saying in what is right or wrong. Um, we're not exactly sure how we would design it, but I mean, it would probably be something like that if we do it. All right, thank you. There. Uh, that would continue the question about the order of events being executed in conjunction with the report substitution. So let's say we have 10 apps that subscribe to that event and they mm. try to substitute with their own report. Mm. What will happen? Last one wins, I guess. Yes. Hey, actually, probably first one. No, actually, last one. So you can, uh, <laughs> you can, uh, all the extensions will be notified about this event, right? And uh, they can each set the new ID. But you can check if some other extension before you already set it, right? If the new report ID is not uh, minus one and it's different than the report ID, then somebody already re replaced it. So you should be a good citizen and leave it be exactly like you do with other uh, event subscribers with the handled pa pa pattern. Anybody else? Okay. I think also we're almost out of time, so. Thank you for Thank you. coming here.